Moon couldn't handle a mystery mind voice and a new school full of noisy dragons all at the same time. She shoved her worries about the voice to the back of her head and tried instead to wrestle with the exhausting energy radiating off a of kinkajou. Where are we going? Moon asked the Rainwing as they headed along the tunnel, past all the sleeping caves, away from the Great Hall. She wondered if she should have brought her school map. Today is an exploring day, Kinkajou said with authority. They want every day to be kind of exploring day. That's the idea of the school. Find out what you're interested in and explore it. I'm interested in going back to my mother, Moon thought. Can I explore that? They? She echoed instead. The Dragonettes of Destiny, Kinkajou said. Although they don't want anyone to call them that anymore, but what are we supposed to call them? The founders of the school make sense too, I guess, but that makes them sound like they're perfectly ancient, like old slabs of rock way under the mountain. I'm really good friends with them, she confided as streaks of dark purple shot through her scales. Especially Queen Glory, we're practically best friends. They knew I wouldn't be able to read the announcements anywhere. I mean, not yet. So Sunny and Clay expected their whole plan to be ahead of time. Announcements? Moon paused to look around and saw a small rectangular board made of dark rock hanging under one of the torches. A note was written on it in chalk. Welcome to the Jade Mountain Academy. Feel free to explore the whole school today and every day. Everything is for you. Food is available in the Prey Center. Talk to Clay if you'd like to sign up for a hunting party. Please come see any of us any time with questions or requests or worries or anything. More information about tomorrow will be posted tonight. Small group discussion classes will begin in the morning. Have a wonderful day. What's a small group discussion class? Moon wondered. It's exactly what this sounds like, Kinkajou said. Come on, come on! She tugged on Moon's wing impatiently, and the physical contact flooded Moon with Kinkajou's radiant excitement. Kinkajou bounded up a side corridor lined with hanging scrolls. As she followed, Moon saw that each scroll had a quote on it. She didn't have time to read them all, but she saw, Knowledge is a flame in the darkness, and The claws of war no match for the wings of wisdom. At the end, they turned into a space full of iridescent green sunlight. It was like stepping into a dream. Scrolls were everywhere, simply everywhere, and cubbyholes along the, all the walls and more racks and cylinders around the cave. Every corner had a spot to curl up and read in, sometimes a rock ledge, sometimes a pile of moss or an arrangement of carpets. Only one reader was in there, a quiet looking mud wing with the scroll curled on some reeds. She didn't look up as they came in. The only image Moon got from her mind was something like ripples on a mud puddle. Sunbeams filtered down through skylights in the roof and windows along one wall. Each of the holes was covered with something thin enough to let the light through, but strong enough to keep the wind and weather out. Moon tilted her head back and studied the closest one. Emerald green, with traces of veins branching through it. Leaves, she whispered. Sunny and Glory got them in the rainforest, Kinkajou said proudly. We use them sometimes in the roofs and our rain wing houses. Aren't they perfect for library windows? Hi, Starflight! She bounded over to a circular wooden desk in the center that was labeled Librarian. A dark head popped up from behind the desk. Hey, Kinkaju. The blind Nightwing leaned forward with a smile as Kinkaju brushed his claws with hers. Is that Moon with you? Uh, hi, Moon said shyly. There was nothing ever hurtful in Starflight's thoughts. His brain was always busy, 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 but he never thought of her as not a real Nightwing or dangerous and untrustworthy. He was like her, an outsider in his own tribe, and he liked scrolls too. She could hear the back of his mind tickling through all the things he still needed to do to get the library completely ready. But he smiled in the direction of her voice. Here's your library stamp, he said, sliding something out from under the desk. I thought you might come by today. Library stamp? Moon echoed curiously, taking it from him. It was a small rectangle of wood, as long as two claws, with her name carved backward in raised letters on one side. We're testing out the system, he said. I'll show you. He brushed his talons over a row of scrolls lined up under the desk. 
Moon spotted a name carved at the wooden end of each one, arranged alphabetically. Starflight touched them lightly until he felt hers, which he pulled out and partially unrolled. The scroll was completely blank. When you want to borrow a scroll, he said, you bring it up here to me. Each one has a unique carved stamp on the end, like these do. I'll stamp your name's scroll with that end to show that you checked it out. And then when you bring it back, we stamp your card over the first image to show that it's been returned. Does that make sense? I think so, Moon said. She turned the stamp over in her claws. She'd never had anything that was really her own before. Could she have a pouch to keep it in? Kingaju asked. Of course. The Starflight fumbled under the desk again for a few minutes, then pulled out a soft black leather pouch on the silver chain. Moon slipped the stamp inside the pouch and put the chain over her neck. It felt like her very first treasure. Thank you, she said. Let me know if I can help you find anything, he said. She heard a flurry of worried what-ifs start up in his mind, circling a well-worn track of anxiety about how to be a blind librarian. She also heard him firmly beat those worries back. He smiled in her direction again. I've been practicing to get the whole space memorized. Moon wondered how she could ask for what she really needed. Do you have any scrolls about ominous voices in your head? Sora, are you still there? Starflight asked, raising his voice a little. The mudwing by the windows lifted her head and nodded. He can't see you! King Kaju reminded her in a loud whisper. Yes, she's still here! Sorry, the brown dragon said softly. It's alright, Starflight said. The twinge of sadness in his thoughts didn't spill into his voice. Sora, this is King Kaju and Moon. Sora is one of Clay's sisters. Ooh, King Kaju said. How does it feel to be related to someone famous? Probably a bit like being best friends with the Queen, she answered herself, grinning ridiculously. <laughs> Which I am, just incidentally, so I mean, I totally get it. Sora's smile was shy, and now Moon could sense tremors of anxiety in her that felt an awful lot like Moon's own fears. Clay's sister was as nervous about being here as Moon was. It was sort of reassuring, actually, to find someone as scared as she was. Nice to meet you, Moon said. Maybe she can be my friend, too. Maybe Mother was right. Maybe I will meet dragons I like here. You, too, Sora nearly whispered, rolling her scroll between her talons. Let's go to the music wing next, King Aju said. Or, ooh, I heard there's an old ghost living somewhere in Jade Mountain. Maybe we could find him. Moon's ears twitched. A ghost? Was she hearing the voice of a ghost? That would be unsettling. You're talking about Stone Mover, Starflight said. And he's not a ghost. He's Sonny's father, and he's perfectly nice old Nightwing who's lived here for ages. He sleeps a lot and doesn't need little dragonette sneaking up on him or pouncing on his tail to find out if he's real. He does like company, though, so if you're interested in a polite conversation with him, I can tell you how to find him. Polite conversation? Yawn! Kinkaju said with a shrug of her wings. You should tell everyone he's a ghost. That would be much more exciting. Not a ghost, but a real Nightwing, Moon thought. Maybe he's the one who could talk in my head. She'd have to ask Starflight for directions later, if she could work up the courage. Are you hungry, Moon? King Aju barreled on. I might be hungry. We should have, we have found the prey center. I haven't done that yet. Which way did the prey center, Starflight? He touched his desk lightly, as if orienting himself, and then pointed at one of the three corridors that led away from the library. Sora, you want to come? King Aju asked, before Moon could think to invite the dragonette herself. The Mudwing shook her head quickly and buried her nose in her scroll again. All right, see you soon, King Aju called over her shoulder as they left. This passageway slanted back down and Moon thought out toward the open air. They passed a couple of branches, but King Aju barely glanced down them before continuing straight. After a few minutes, Moon caught the scent of living prey up ahead and the jumble of several voices, both real world and inside her head. Uh-oh... It was even worse than it sounded. The prey center was total chaos, the opposite of the serene, well-ordered library. It was a mammoth cave open to the air on one side, looking out over a mossy, boulder-strewn slope 
towering cliffs and faraway peaks. There was a low wall of rocks built across the bottom of the opening, useless against dragons, of course, but perfect for keeping prey trapped inside. A fast-flowing river swept along the wall opposite the opening, disappearing through an archway into the next cave. And there was prey all over the place. Shaggy, bleeding sheep blundered helplessly under the dragon's talons, yelling in panic. Several speckled brown chickens, quail, and pheasants were racing around the floor, periodically bursting skyward in an explosion of feathers and squawks. In one corner, a fat black bear was squaring off with a dragon at twice its size, growling. Worse still, the cave was filled with shouting dragons. Most of them were Mudwing, Sandwing, and Skywing dragonettes who were gleefully trying to corner the rampaging chickens. They bellowed instructions at one another, yowled when the pheasants dodged them, and shrieked hilariously whenever birds nearly flew up their snouts. At the same time, their minds were all shouting, worrying, planning, reacting, and it felt to Moon like a hundred dragons talking at once. Clay, meanwhile, was standing on a tall boulder in the middle of the cave, trying to shout over all the noise. Everyone stop moving, he bellowed. Especially you, chickens. Chickens, give up. We're going to eat you. There's nothing you can do about it. Stop running away right now. The chickens shrilled back. Kingaju spotted a small mountain of fruit piled near the river and darted over to it. Another rain-winged dragonette was there, picking through the options, and Kingaju shouted something cheerful at him. Moon hesitated, wishing she could sink right into the mountain and disappear. She was hungry, but it was so loud and horribly overwhelming in here. Maybe she could sneak back to her cave and wait to eat until the middle of the night. Surely be quieter then. But Kingaju spotted her as she tried to slide away. The rain wing flapped her wings wildly, beckoning, and finally Moon had to duck her head and sprint over, hoping not to get hit by any chicken parts on her way. Moon, this is my friend Coconut, Kingaju said. Thought he was my friend, shimmered through her mind, and Moon had a moment to wonder if Kingaju did have a dark, bitter side after all, before Kingaju added blithely. At least I thought he was my friend until I got abducted by bad guys for three weeks and he didn't even notice I was gone! She poked him pointedly with her tail. Didn't I say I was sorry about that? Coconut mumbled through a mouthful of papaya. His scales were kind of quiet lavender blue and his eyes were sleepy. Or did I? Something like that. Mostly, you say, what? Every time I bring it up, Kingaju said. She turned to Moon. I'm going to learn to read aeons before he does. Why is that? Coconut asked mildly. Because I'm smart and you're not, Kingaju pointed out. That was implied, Coconut. It was subtext. Right, he said, not in the least offended, perhaps because he only seemed to be partially following the conversation. The mangoes are pretty good, he said to Moon. I was told to eat them first because they're all ripe. I am like bananas better, but mangoes are fine. I don't particularly like coconut, though. Ironically, Kingaju said, what? See? She said to Moon, grinning. Moon nodded, unable to speak through the cacophony inside and outside her ears. At least Coconut's thoughts were slow and meaningless, although she thought she might go mad if she had to listen to them all day long. He passed her three mangoes, and she sliced them open with her claws, the way she had taught herself to do when she was alone in the rainforest during one of her mother's longer absences. Oof! Said a voice behind her. Moon jumped and nearly dropped her mangoes in the river. It's just me, Clay said to her kindly. I'm glad you found Kingaju. I thought you'd be a good match. You did? Moon thought with bewilderment. She couldn't see anything in common between herself and the bubbly rain wing. Clay shooed a chicken away from the fruit and glanced around the tumultuous cave. So, he said, my plan hasn't exactly gone as planned. Clay, this place is madness, Kingaju said with a laugh. I know, he said ruefully. We'll try something different tomorrow. I thought it'd be fun to bring in live prey and let everyone chase it around. That's what we did in our cave sometimes, growing up, when the guardians wanted us to practice hunting, but wouldn't let us go outside. 
I guess it's a little more manageable with five dragonets than thirty-five. He wrinkled his snout at the nearest panicking sheep. Kengaju shook her head. I say anyone who is gross enough to eat something that's alive and wriggling deserves to be pecked. You should take those dragons out hunting with you and leave the rest of us here to enjoy our quiet, sensible fruit in peace. That's a good idea, Clay said. In the meanwhile, maybe we'll get Tsunami and see if she can help me calm things down. He gave Moon another reassuring smile and hurried out of the prey center. Moon heard the words quiet and peace and calm, as if from a long way away. Through the raucous noise of the dragon mines around her, she could sense something running toward the cave, something like a small thread of pure terror, so tiny it could be blown away in a breeze, but so intense she couldn't miss it, even in the howling gale of emotions in the prey center. Who is that? And why is her mind so strange? There were no words to go along with the emotions, and there was something fuzzy about it. Could it be a really young dragonette? She lifted her head and turned to watch for it. But as she did, a vast icicle of cold fury stabbed through her brain, and she staggered back, crushing the mangoes in her talons with an involuntary convulsion. Bright yellow-orange pulp splattered all over Kinkajou and Coconut and the rocks around them. Kinkajou let out a startled yelp. But before Moon could apologize or even get speech back under her control, a louder commotion erupted near one of the tunnels. Catch it! Mine! I claim it! It's mine! It went that way! All the Mudwings and Skywings abandoned the chickens at once and bolted over to that side of the cave. Moon felt the thread of fear twist higher and brighter, as if it had been set on fire. And then a small shape shot between the dragons and came pelting across the cave, dodging sheep and chickens, and Moon saw what everyone was chasing. A scavenger! She had read about them and seen drawings, but she had never encountered a real scavenger before. She'd never given them much thought. Apart from stealing the Sandwing treasure and killing Queen Oasis 20 years ago, they were just creatures who happened to live on the same planet as the dragons. But suddenly, this one was right here and blazing in her mind as brightly as any dragon. She saw it spot the sheep and chickens, including the ones that had been caught and half-eaten already, and she saw it stumble as a bolt of despair went through it. Why can I feel the scavenger's fear, but nothing from the sheep or chickens? She wondered. Aren't they the same? The icy anger she had felt before swept into the cave like an avenging blizzard. An ice wing, pale blue as a frozen ocean, with glittering scales like overlapping chips of ice. He stormed through the yelling crowd of dragonettes, who were still trying to find the scavenger underfoot, and Moon realized he was chasing the little animal as well. The little scavenger didn't stand a chance. He had fled into the worst possible place. Someone in the prey center was definitely going to catch him and eat him, and Moon would have to feel his awful terror as it happened. She couldn't watch it die. She couldn't let that happen to something so scared, so helpless and alive and alone and clearly aware of what's about to happen. Moon bolted over to the scavenger, cut it off as it tried to dodge around her, darted left to block its retreat, and deftly snatched up in her claws. It's all right, she whispered to it. I'm not going to hurt you. It did no good. The scavenger's heartbreaking fear buzzed even more clearly in her mind now that she was holding it. It put its little paws over its head and curled into a ball between her talons. Silence slowly spread across the cave. Moon looked up and found the ice wing only inches away, glaring at her with dark blue eyes. Night swing, he thought with a flash of vicious hatred that made her wince. He hissed slowly, exhaling a hint of deadly frostbeth into the air between them. You have ten seconds to give me back my scavenger, he snarled, before I slice your face off. 